My name is Dan Stewart and I'm the international editor for Time. I'm pleased to be joined today by Kai Fu Lee. Kai Fu has been at the forefront of AI innovation for over three decades at Apple, Microsoft, and Google, and today as an investor in Chinese tech startups. He knows what makes Silicon Valley tick, but also how Chinese innovators are catching up. Kai Fu, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, uh, you're in uh, Beijing, I understand? Uh, yes, yes, great to be here, Dan. I'm in Beijing. That's right. Well, um, I wanted to start today um, just by talking about the coronavirus is causing a huge global downturn and a massive transformation in the way that we live and work. Do you think this is going to be a moment when the development of AI stalls or conversely when it accelerates? Uh, I think it will accelerate. Uh, first of all, AI today largely runs on data as the fuel. Uh, so that's why I often say data is the new oil. And uh, the data that's been feeding AI uh, prior to the pandemic are the internet access logs, the usage patterns on Amazon, Google, also uh, autonomous vehicles, computer vision, uh, Alexa are all collecting data and AI learns from that data. So think about what happens in the pandemic. Uh, we are working from home. We are online. Uh, we are contributing to the process of digitization. So a lot of the people who used to go to work and still not fully digitized, that is by meetings, taking notes on paper, now it's becoming uh, all digitized. And all that digital content becomes training data for AI. So AI could, for example, look at this session that you and I are having and learn more about my thoughts, your thoughts, uh, and also learn more about uh, human expression, uh, emotion, uh, articulation of speech, and uh, all that will contribute to AI being able to do a very good job uh, uh, for people. Uh, for example, performing key functions like um, customer service, uh, sales that are currently conducted online. Uh, AI will be able to do that. Uh, AI will be able to uh, contribute a lot in these uh, online activities and take over the routine tasks that we have. But also, um, the next big uh, frontier for AI is got to be healthcare. And we're all now focused on whether it's use of AI in robots for delivery or using it for medical uh, drug discovery or vaccine discovery. A lot of money is being pumped into AI healthcare. So that's another big one. And finally, uh, there is the social distancing. So a lot of jobs that are a bit dangerous because they contact so many people, whether it's uh, healthcare jobs in hospitals, uh, waiters and waitresses in restaurants and so on, uh, we're seeing a very rapid replacement of those jobs uh, by robot currently for our safety. Uh, for example, when I was quarantined uh, in Beijing, when I returned to Beijing, uh, all my food and e-commerce and packages were delivered by robots to, to my doorstep. So it's accelerating uh, that adoption um, and gradual. And even after the pandemic, we will really not go back to the way it was for all three of these types of um, habit uh, forming. Well, let me pick up on what you were saying about healthcare there, because one big concern we're all concerned about at the moment is um, is getting past this stage where we're, we are victims of the coronavirus. A, a big part of that is going to be testing. A huge part of that eventually is going to be the development of a vaccine. Um, very early on in the crisis, um, the White House uh, made a call to action for the AI community to help analyze the, the literature that was being published on COVID-19, the, the data. Um, can you tell me what was the response like to that within the AI community that, that the White House had made a call like that? Uh, I think the whole world is uh, really trying to work together in, in using AI and data. And part of that first part is contributing data. So there are a number of data sets that were being created. Uh, one was uh, uh, Kaggle, which is a part of Google. And these data sets were put online for amateurs and professionals alike to see who can do a better job of using AI to detect uh, whether someone has COVID-19 or not, or using AI for various types of uh, uh, treatments, uh, vaccine discovery. Uh, one of our companies uh, that we invested in uh, worked on using generative chemistry along with AI for faster discovery of uh, possible ways to block 
uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, from, from functioning in one's body. So there are many examples like that. And, and um, uh, I, I should say, however, because the pandemic is once a century kind of thing, um, the AI people didn't have a lot of practice. So we're just getting to be good at it. And I think the pace of innovation, acceleration, faster vaccine discovery, that will happen uh, probably in the coming months. Uh, last few months, a lot of it was just getting ready because it's not a task that's ever been done before by the AI community. But now uh, I think the whole world is working together, which is also a very, very good thing. Mm -hmm. You said before that this is going to accelerate this moment in AI. You've warned uh, in, in your writing about the risk that comes with accelerated AI, right? The, the, the loss of blue collar jobs, the complete transformation of the labor market, and the things that we need to do to overcome that. Um, is there a risk if AI acceleration, uh, you know, if AI accelerates that much faster, that the opposite, the damage becomes that much more work, that much worse? As we accelerate the AI automating blue collar, white collar routine work, it will have uh, two serious um, impacts on society. The first one is, of course, um, many jobs will be gone. And some people have lost their jobs. And uh, in a few months, when uh, they're ready to go back to work, they might find the jobs not there anymore. So it's just an employment issue exacerbated by um, COVID-19 and the use of automation. So that's, I think, a, uh, a very significant problem. And another, uh, perhaps even more serious problem, is an exacerbation of wealth inequality. So uh, we all know that tech tycoons probably made money in the last few months for various reasons, um, including the stocks are up and so on. But many of the people who lost their jobs are on the bottom 50%. And we already have a wealth inequality going on for the last 20 years, uh, partly because of the computer and internet revolution. And now AI will make that go even faster. And I think um, COVID-19 will further accept that. So it's a big um, policy issue I think all governments have to look at. Governments and businesses, right? I suppose it's on businesses as well to be um, you're training their workforces and, and, and education. Do you see that happening already at these big tech companies, both in the U.S. and in China? Uh, yes, there are a few shining examples. Um, Amazon actually provided a um, employee training subsidy of, I think, $12,000 for up to four years for job categories that might be disappearing for them to take on a new job. For example, someone who's a picker in an Amazon a warehouse or maybe a cashier at a uh, Whole Foods, uh, and then they get training for free, subsidized by the company uh, for things like aeronautic engineer, nursing, and so on. I think that's a great thing. All, I think all companies should look at that. Uh, training is no longer just making someone better in what they do, but also when job categories are reduced or disappear, it's about getting new skills with a longer training skills that cannot be automated. And um, uh, I have to also acknowledge that not every company has the financial wherewithal that uh, Amazon has. So we can't expect corporate to take care of the um, uh, upcoming um, job changes because not every company has that financial uh, resource and not every company has a multitude of jobs uh, uh, and, and with an equilibrium, with an equal number going away and equal number being created. So the government has to step in, I believe. Well, you've written uh, a lot in your book as well about the differences between uh, the technology industry in the US and the technology, uh, technology industry in China. Um, uh, you've said that innovation has sort of lagged behind in the US but compared to China, especially in the field of AI. Do you think that this is going to change that element, that there's going to be more competitiveness coming out of the coronavirus? Uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, when I wrote my book, AI Superpowers, uh, about two years ago, uh, what I noticed was that the fundamental research innovations uh, is where U.S. led the world, and China was faster in implementing AI technologies, monetizing them, and creating value out of entrepreneurship and large companies using AI. So what has happened since the last two years 
is on China side, uh, Chinese research has advanced quite a bit. So if we look at the top 10% of all the best AI papers, now China produces almost an equal uh, percentage as the US. So China's been growing on where it was weak. But interestingly, US has been growing on adopting uh, using AI um, in, in the actual day-to-day uh, -day work. Uh, China was uh, way ahead in things like uh, mobile payment, uh, food delivery, robotics for delivery, and things like that. But we also saw recently uh, in, in, the U, in the U.S., uh, very quickly, people's habits were forming about uh, 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 ordering food from home, about use of robotics in various places, uh, in using more mobile technologies, mobile payment. You know, companies uh, uh, like um, DoorDash and uh, Grubhub and uh, PayPal are really getting the limelight and also Zoom and other companies doing video conferencing. That's an area U.S. really led. So interestingly, I think both the U.S. and China have uh, made up for their weaknesses and are, are now um, charging forward. And I think that's a tremendous benefit to both Chinese and American consumers uh, because their respective uh, companies in their countries are now building great products that are benefiting our day-to-day -day lives. Well, that's right. And, you know, at the same time as this is happening, obviously, relations at a sort of policy level, at a government level, have become more tense. Um, do you see in the industry um, that there's still an appetite for collaboration um, as well as competition between the US and China? I think companies are generally very practical. So as long as there are no regulatory or legal restrictions, companies would like to work together. It makes sense to have a global supply chain uh, and companies help uh, building things that they're good at and depending on other companies for things that they're good at. Uh, but we also do see a uh, increasing decoupling between US and China. So I think the, in the future, that will largely depend on um, how much uh, government uh, policies will basically force the companies to do the unnatural things to do things, uh, the decoupling is inefficient. Uh, however, it is um, if it's part of a national policy uh, for whatever reasons that each country may have, then it may have to be done. There are some very legitimate reasons. For example, uh, countries who have to have control of their own supply chain and not be beholden to, uh, uh, to another country during uh, natural disasters like the pandemic. So I understand that. But the full decoupling, I think, is, uh, is quite challenging. Uh, one area that I see a lot of uh, collaboration and gives me a lot of hope is the research community. When you go to an AI conference, you really see Americans, Chinese, uh, Europeans uh, mixing together, sharing ideas openly, uh, publishing uh, instantly, and uh, uh, helping each other out uh, with data sets and collaborations. So I do hope, even if uh, the competition intensifies and there are regulations making it necessary to have some degree of decoupling that the research can continue to move forward. Because after all, AI got to where it got to because we were all able to stand on the shoulders of giants. And these are giants from uh, countries everywhere. We're currently in a moment now where we're seeing um, uh, protests against racial inequality, uh, primarily in the United States, but also across the world. Um, and this is something, this is an area where um, AI has had accusations leveled against it because um, AI is only as good as the data that um, goes into it, and data often has uh, racial and gender biases that we don't see. Um, what responsibilities do you think those working in the field have to ensure that AI is, is free of those kinds of biases? Uh, I believe there's some awareness. Uh, the reason that there are some bias in most AI systems is because either the engineer, uh, the product manager who built the product was unaware or didn't care about the issue. And the other possibility is that the data in itself is inherently unbalanced, let's say with more men than women, with more um, white men than um, Asian men, for example, then it could create a bias because it didn't have enough sample size. So what I think is incumbent on people in the AI community and engineering community to do is first to educate the engineers to know that it is their responsibility 
not just to build a good product and make money and help the users, but also ensure that the products don't have bias and that these biases can uh, sift through really without care, just with some careless um, act, not intentional, malicious, malicious act, and, and that people have a responsibility to go the extra mile, that engine training of the engineers. The other is building tools, tools that will watch uh, AI products being built and alert the, um, the developer that if it sees there is an imbalanced data set that it's not recognizing, let's say, um, African-American women as well, or that it's give, not giving uh, older Asians a chance at a job. So tools that can alert the engineers, the other thing we can do. I, I think uh, this is something I think affects the whole world. And I think that's a silver lining that um, will give people a wake up call that uh, it's our responsibility to do that, to remove bias in the systems. Um, you've written before, and I think it's commonly understood that um, over the past sort of three decades, AI has developed in sort of fits and starts. You know, these sort of bursts of innovation followed by AI uh, winters, I think, as you described them. Um, yeah. Do you still see us in a kind of, is, are we in a sort of perpetual summer of AI now? Or, uh, or do you see autumnal clouds on the horizon in the sort of next generation of AI development? I'm talking beyond machine learning here. Um, and into the realm of you know, self-driving cars and some of the other kind of major applications of technology that would come with, with, uh, with smart AI? I think the next 10 years uh, will be the, a very long summer of AI, where AI will find all kinds of opportunities to blossom in all kinds of industries. Uh, when we think about AI, AI isn't just the human-like intelligence behavior uh, recognizing, understanding speech and the uh, people and being able to ro have robots that move around that uh, can think like people. That's the most advanced form of AI. There are many forms of uh, simpler forms of AI applied to data science, uh, helping financial institutions make more money, helping to do routine jobs uh, with AI so that people can do more meaningful jobs. These data-oriented AI are arguably the uh, largest uh, lower hanging fruit that exists everywhere. Uh, traditional companies uh, have only adopted AI by about 4%. And when they adopt AI, we often see uh, several percent, maybe even 10 or 20% improvement to the bottom line. So uh, I really think that in the next 10 years, we're going to see um, adoption, one industry followed by another, the use of AI starting with these simpler uses and gradually moving towards uh, recognition, understanding, and autonomous vehicles and robots. And, and along the way, in the next 10 years, this will create about $16 trillion of net incremental GDP, uh, as uh, Pricewaterhouse has, has uh, forecasted. So I am a big optimist. Having said that, uh, AI, like anything else, when there is too much um, excitement and optimism, it becomes hype and the expectations become too high, the valuation become ridiculous, and it has to come down. So in this uh, rise over time, I don't think it'll be a smooth line to the, uh, to, to the top, but there'll be ups and downs. But the, gra the trajectory in the next 10, 10 years will be a tremendous one, uh, one of the largest periods of um, value creation by technology that we have ever seen. So we've just got to be prepared for some summer storms along the way. <laughs> all right. Well, thank uh, you yes. very much, Taifu. I think that's all we have time for today. Um, really appreciate you talking to us today. Great. Thanks a lot.